I think that the act of ticking the box of doing research is ending. However, I think that that's an opportunity for insights because the value of consumer insights as what that is, is to provide insights on consumers and on the marketplace is now more relevant than ever. And there, and as the world is changing rapidly, you need to find ways in which you can, you can provide that insight in a more tangible way that 120 slide deck. Nobody has time for that anymore. Uh, we just need to realize that that is the thing that we need to answer and not go super ner nerdy on methodology and, and, and just focus on that, which I believe has been our, our Achilles heel, right? We love the method and we go super deep on the method. Nobody cares about the method. They care about the value that you're bringing to the organization. So I think that those insight professionals that really believe that and they want to drive the business forward instead of staying on the method are the ones that I see are being really successful within their company. Resource, lack of interest, lack of time. Many of our customers don't, don't have the ability of doing the insights that they would like to do when they test on Zappi, which is unfortunate, frankly, because it is actually really easy and it's really interesting and it's really fun. So it's a little frustrating that for whatever reason, again, for many people, that's not a, that's not a possibility. So we have a consulting program where we curate people, train them on the Zappi platform and match them up as much as possible with customers. Um, ideally in the same vertical that they were working on or within the same areas of application. And in some cases it's only, you know, like a couple studies because it's not systematic, but in some other cases it is systematic and, and it's a win-win because our customers are able to de-risk themselves in terms of having to pay, uh, you know, a full-time employee. It's great for the consultants as well, because candidly, they make more money and they have more flexibility. Now, of course, there's a risk because whenever you are a freelancer, there is a risk, right? Like if for whatever reason, um, the volume is not there, well, that's a problem. But many people that I know want the flexibility and appreciate the fact that they're not having to deal with all the politics, but rather just focus on the insights, which is really, really cool. So we have a, a, you know, a few instances where it's working out really, really well, both for the customer and for the consultant. Beautiful portfolio, which many researchers don't have, by the way, you know, because all of the stuff that you've done is proprietary. When you leave your job, you don't like take all of these beautiful reports that you've created and all the insight and value that you have driven. So it's difficult. Um, something to consider, I guess. But even if you have a beautiful portfolio, having someone that trusts you either within the organization or someone that somebody knows um, and they trust them and recommend somebody makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference for me as well because I'm putting my organization at risk when I put a consultant in front of somebody and I haven't worked with them at length. I, you know, we trained them and everything completely, but there are some things that, that we don't address, right? Like, within the training, we don't know if that person is going to be responsive or not going to be responsive. Um, one of the things that we're going to have to start doing is how well or not does this person present? You know, all of that stuff is, is essential. And when you have somebody that already has worked with that person, it's ideal because then the trust is already there. So sometimes what we're doing is we are onboarding consultants that the customer recommends. Say, oh, we've worked with this person before or this person used to be um, within the organization and now they, they have a, they have, they're freelancing and then we onboard them. In some ways, it's easier to teach Zappi to someone that already understands the organization and the strategy than it is for somebody that knows Zappi and try to teach them the organization and strategy. But a recruiter has a very different perspective than an employer. And probably 90% of whom these people are working with is just going direct to the companies. A lot, I wouldn't say many are using recruiters as much. What do you think? So I'll tell you our experience. Our default is to not use a recruiter unless we have a situation where our traditional ways of hiring, which include some job boards that we utilize to officialize the, the submissions, as well as primarily networking and what we post on LinkedIn does not work. But as I was referring to the other day, we are pretty active on social media and that does help. 
but in this in this latest role that we just filled out we had 400 people applying for it and about half were good applications so we don't necessarily need to use a recruiter but if for whatever reason we just were not able to find the right person then that's the route we will go so i wouldn't if i were if i were looking for a job right now i would not just like rely on recruiters exclusively. I would definitely work with some and I would make sure that they know who I am so that if the perfect opportunity came through, they would reach out to me. But I would be very active on primarily on LinkedIn. Um, frankly, I think that having a, having a strong personal brand makes a difference and making sure that others understand what you are all about is key, right? So having a congruent personal brand that addresses exactly what your value will be is key. I'll give you my own. I'm all about customer centricity because I live it and I bleed it. So everything that I do is referring to customer centricity. It's just something that I believe in. Um, that's not the case for everybody, right? Like some other people is transformation. Some other people is, you know, they're very technical and they're about like statistical analysis. It doesn't really matter. I believe that it's really the stuff that drives you forward and that motivates you. Once that is the case, if there is that link between what you're passionate about and what that organization needs, nobody will beat you to that job because they will see your passion through it. So I think that whichever way is just like a way for you to get in touch with a person that has that need. Now, now we also talked about a recruitment process and there are things that are basic. So we all have a resume. I've gotten questions around LinkedIn on should I have an updated LinkedIn? Um, I think that you absolutely should because that helps you understand who are you connected with, what type of work you've done, what does your career trajectory look like? Um, but, and this is not the case for everybody in my perspective, I work for a technology company. So if you are not comfortable enough with somebody like LinkedIn, I know that you're probably not gonna be the right fit for my organization, right? We write, we write software, that's what we do. Um, in addition to that, and having a really good and differentiated um, CV is important. And then I often get asked about the question on the, on the cover letter, because writing a cover letter takes a lot of time. And when you're applying to many jobs, it's difficult to write a, a really thought throughout cover letter um, every single time. However, the, the reason why I think cover letters are really important is because they are the link between your trajectory, your experience, your expertise, and what this business is trying to do. Um, you can't do that with your, with your, just with your resume. This organization has an opening or this organization has a strategy that you have identified. The cover letter helps you say, this is what I've done in my life and this is why and where I will be able to help you. I think that that is invaluable. Um, there are instances where when I have a ton of CVs, I need to differentiate. Sometimes I have not even looked at the ones or set, an, set a meeting or a phone screening with those that don't have a cover letter because it gives me a couple of thoughts. One is that person didn't even take the time to do that. So they don't really care about my organization as much as some, somebody else that went into my, web, my website, understood my strategy and wrote a letter to explain to me why they can add value. Um, so when you're trying to differentiate yourself, I think that the cover letter is important. Now on the back end, once you've had an interview, um, this is gonna sound super basic, but please make sure that you send the thank you note. Regardless of how the interview went or not, this pe person spent 30 minutes or 45 minutes of their time to meet with you and try to get to hear what you had to say. I think that the least thing that you wanna do is thank them. There's been instances where really good, um, really good candidates have not followed up. And that also tells me something, right? I have, uh, I lead an organization that is meant to drive customer centricity. If somebody does not send the thank you letter, it makes me believe that they will not follow up with a customer in, in that situation. So it kind of like decreases the interest that I have in that candidate. So basic, but send a thank you note. Send a, a thank you note that is linked to the interview, telling why you're excited about it, how based on what you heard, you can, you can add a lot of value to that company. I think those things will help you stand out and, and will, will, help in the process, I think. So I'll give, you, I'll give you my experience as I transition from a more traditional corporate job to a, to a job in a, in a technology organization um, of things that, 
in some cases they're going to be basic in some cases they're not going to but if i had some time between job a and job b to upskill myself with based on my current position i would i would recommend this stupid but really important for me it was a pain in the butt to move from a pc environment to an apple environment um it's it sounds really ridiculous but it makes a difference so getting that is key um many technology organizations operate within apple so that's that's important similar i was excellent at powerpoint but google slides i was excellent at excel but google sheets that the interface is slightly different it makes a difference so all getting up to speed around kind of like those um technology stacks that are being used are important tableau um all the all the all the cloud based ones um you know understanding what is uh a trello board um slack uh all of those things that software organizations start to use is, is key i'll give you another one that is important agile agile is a way in which software organizations operate and it's not a buzzword it's actually a way of working understanding how that works is important understanding what agile is is key um and then more technical stuff as well so we always i grew up in like spss but now there's r as well which is really really important there's also the basics of um of writing code right so python or something like that all of that is available so i'm not saying that overnight somebody's going to become a developer but if you're going to work with any organization that writes some type of software understanding the basics of it is going to be good it took me a little while to get up to speed and i think that that you know getting getting to that point is useful